Well, good morning. Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you for being here with us today, all of you in the room. Thank you for joining us online with our online community as well. We're just so glad that you are a part of what God is doing here at Avalon Church. Well, I'm very excited today uh, to make an announcement to you, and some of you probably already know what it is, but uh, very excited. I was thinking about what God has done in our church in the history. In September, we'll be 20 years old. And about 20 years ago, yeah, that's something to celebrate. We've seen a lot of people come to know Christ and follow Christ in baptism here in the last 20 years. And it's just been amazing what we've seen as far as the number of families God has put together, the number of people that uh, have come here and found hope and just found uh, complete and total life change and transformation And I just believe it's just been a a beautiful fulfilling of our vision, of our mission, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, the the key to that is we want to bring people. And I realized during the last year, there have been a lot of things that have impacted you in your own life, as well as the church. I mean, the last year, think about it. Um, A lot of people have not been able to physically come. Some of you are coming back. I'm very, very glad about that. Very thankful that we're able to start gathering again. Still a lot of people that haven't made it back yet. So we've been impacted in that way. I believe that our staff has been incredibly impacted because, you know, what do you do when you've never faced something like this before? Uh, how do you know if you're being successful? How do you know if you're doing the right thing? Because there have just been so many challenges with COVID-19. But I want to tell you, I've been so proud of you. I've been so excited about how God has worked through you because you have been faithful. And even though not everybody's been able to be physically present, there have been a lot of people. In fact, we have more people joining us online than we do in person still. And, uh, but many of you have been faithful to give. Many of you have been faithful just to be there. And I'm very, very thankful for that. In fact, let's give a hand to all the people that have been faithful uh, during this time. Just a blessing. A huge, huge blessing. And I want to let you know that I really, really appreciate that. And I was thinking about this. Um, when we started this church, it was a big act of faith. When I felt that God was calling us to start this church, and by us, I mean Kim and me, we had no money, we had no members, we had no building, we had no chairs, we had no equipment, we had nothing but faith, and God blessed our faith. We believed that God was going to do something. We believed that God had a plan. We believed that God had something big for us, and boy, God began to bless us, and boy, you know, when you first start out starting a church, it's challenging because once again, you don't have any building, you don't have any money, you don't have any members, and it's a, it's a big challenge of faith. Well, as we grew and as we kept on going, we got our first building and God did miracles. I'm going to share some of that with you during this series that you don't want to miss. It's so encouraging to remember how God blesses and how God provides. And, and I remember that when we began to take that first step of faith and getting in that first building that we're in, It was a huge step of faith, and God grew the church because of our faith. And then we were there for a while, and then we came to this building, and we don't own this building. We lease it. And for the past uh, 15 plus years, we've been here in this building leasing it, and, uh, but God still blessed our faith, and we saw many, many people come to know Christ because of our obedience and faith. And we are at a point in our church that we're getting ready to take another step of faith. And and for some, it's probably a big step of faith. And I believe that God is going to bless us, not just because of our plans, because we all know that plans can go wrong, right? I mean, I had all kinds of plans uh, during 2020, but they all went away because God said, no, that's not what's going to happen. So we can plan, but we also got to have faith in God that he is in control. But I believe that God blesses our faith And I believe that we're getting ready to see another move of God in a way that is going to further the kingdom of God, going to help us reach more people for the kingdom of God, going to do more in your life and more for your faith than probably anything that you've ever done. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see what God does in our church and in my life and in your life as well. Well, today we start a brand new series called Doing Our Part. 
And what this series is about, it's about preparing our church to move into a new facility. So yeah, I've just let the cat out of the bag. The big announcement that we're making today is that we are going to be moving. I'm going to wait till the end of the message today to share with you some stuff, some pictures, some different things that you can pray about. Um, but in this message today, I want to talk about positioning yourself for a miracle. And I love what it said on the screen earlier. Uh, we don't want to just move. We want to see a move. In other words, see a move of God. And I'll be honest with you, that is what I desire for our church more than anything, a move of God. That is what I desire for your life more than anything, a move of God. So why are we going to be moving as a church? Why are we physically going to be changing locations? Well, number one is to prepare our church to better spread the gospel and reach more people. Understand that everything that we do here at Avalon Church is driven by our belief that God has called us to bring people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, bringing people, I want to encourage you to bring people, bring people to church with you, bring people to come worship with you, invite your neighbors. I realize that during the last year, uh, we haven't had that much opportunity to do this, but we're starting to see that opportunity again. And even if you don't bring someone physically to the church service, you can always invite somebody to watch with you online. And so we're going to do this because, number one, and first and foremost, and the underlying reason for everything that we're doing here, got, excuse me, I got to get this table straight and square with the end of the stage because I am um, uh, ADHD and OCD and uh, whatever all the other letters are, uh, FBI and all that stuff. So, um, but I had to get that straight. Otherwise, I could not bring you the word of God because I'd be thinking about that the entire time. Dear Lord, pray for me. All right, so I need help. But that is the number one reason underlying everything that we do here is to bring glory to God, to bring people into the kingdom of God, to reach people that are not like we are yet. That's where that wherever they are part is. If you ever get to the point where you forget what it was like before you knew Christ, you need to ask God to give you revival. If you ever get to the point where you hang around everybody that's Christian, but you have no people in your life that need the gospel, that need Jesus, you might want to reassess your plans. You see, the truth of the matter is, we've got to reach people wherever they are. And by the way, do you know that the emphasis in the New Testament that Jesus gave was not on people to come, but rather on us to go? Wherever we are, People that look different than we are, that vote different than we do, that act differently than we do, that believe differently than we do. You bring people wherever they are, but this is the most important part, because if we just brought people to church with no purpose, if there was nothing more than gathering to sing, and that's wonderful, the, the worship here is wonderful, if you just gathered here to hear me teach the Word of God, uh, or something of that nature, or the program for the children, if that's all there was then ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is that's not a reason to come to church. That's not a reason to volunteer your time. That is not a reason to give of your resources, trusting that God is going to get the good news around the world. That's not enough. But rather, we must position ourselves uh, to be used by God in order to see a miracle of God. We don't want to just move. We want to see a move of God. Amen? Do we believe that today? I am convinced with all my heart that we must bring people wherever they are, but you know what the most important part of that is? Into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's about you becoming more like Jesus. You know, we use all kinds of Christian words that a lot of people that aren't in church don't understand. We use words like discipleship. Now, that just simply means becoming a disciple. It means to become more like Jesus is all it means. And there is a need in every person's life, no matter where you are, to become more like Jesus. I've been a Christian now. I'm 56 years old. I got saved when I was eight years old. So that, what is that? 40-something years, all right? I'm not, a, I'm not a Georgia Tech grad, so, and I don't have my phone out that I can use my calculator, all right? Uh, so that's, uh, what is that? Is that 44 or is that 48? 
48, okay. Don't put me in charge of counting the offerings. All right, so, um, but for 48 years, I've been a follower of Jesus Christ. And um, the fact is, I need to become more like Jesus. Even though after 48 years, I'm still a follower of Jesus. You might be a brand new follower of Jesus. But no matter where you are, we all need to become more like Jesus. Well, we want to also be better stewards. That's the reason we were going to make this move. You see, for many years now, um, we've been renting and leasing this place. And for a, a very large portion of that time, it's been a real blessing. When we first moved in here, you could, there were no buildings around here. You could see it. And uh, we had a lot of visibility. But we have uh, seen in recent years, we, have, um, we pay enough rent to finance millions of dollars. And we just believe that it is a waste of money, a waste of God's money for us to continue to invest in something that we get no return on. And so what our goal is, is to be better stewards, and this is going to help us manage the resources that God has given us. And then number three, the reason we're doing this is to increase our faith and our effectiveness. We believe we're going to be able to do some things in the long term that are going to uh, lend itself to our being not only better stewards of God's resources, but also to be more effective as a church and to grow and to reach more people for the kingdom of God. So today, we're going to talk about positioning yourself for a miracle. Let me just give you um, this passage from John chapter 6. In fact, this passage is recorded in all four Gospels, one of the few events that is recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 men. We say feeding of the 5,000, but it's probably more like 20,000 because 5,000 was just the men. There were probably around 5,000 women there as well and probably somewhere around uh, 8 to 10,000 children there as well. So when you think about what Jesus did, he didn't just feed 5,000, he fed fed probably close to 20,000 People. So let's begin looking in verse number one of John 6. And after this, Jesus crossed over the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miracles as he healed the sick. And then Jesus went up into the hills and sat down with his disciples around him. And it was nearly time for the annual Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a great crowd of people climbing the hill looking for him. And I want to just pause and say, they had been really busy. They had been on a speaking tour, if you will. They were ministering to people, and they were tired. They were taking a little R&R. They were going to take some spiritual renewal. But Jesus saw the crowd, and he had compassion on them. He said to Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? And he was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. By the way, God does that to us a lot. He tests us. He knows what it's going to do. He knows the outcome, and we can trust him. Philip replied, it would take a small fortune to feed them. And then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus ordered. So all of them, the men alone numbered 5,000, sat down on the grassy slopes. And then Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks to God. And passed them out to the people. And afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate until they were full. Now gather the leftovers, Jesus told his disciples, so that nothing is wasted. And there were only five barley loaves to start with, but 12 baskets were filled with the pieces of bread the people did not eat. Well, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today on how to position yourself for a miracle. How do you position yourself for a move of God, for God to work on your behalf? Well, the truth is, most all of us want a miracle, but we don't want to be in the position to need a miracle. Have you ever noticed how that works? We want a miracle of God, we just don't want to be in the situation where we need a miracle or a move of God. But I'm telling you that no matter where you are, no matter how comfortable you are in life, no matter how uncomfortable you are in life, we all need God to move in our life. And when he does, it makes a difference in our life. Here's the first thing you got to do if you're going to position yourself. You know, in positioning yourself, uh, just about everything has to be preceded by positioning yourself. 
An athlete, a football player, has to position himself correctly or he does not uh, score or catch the ball or run the ball or make the play. A basketball team, the exact same thing. Players have to be in position in order to win the game. In our relationships, you know, you got to get yourself in a position uh, to be uh, attractive. A lot of people don't realize that it's not the looks that just attracts another person, but it's the character. It's the way that we behave. It's our attitude. You got to position yourself to be attractive in a dating relationship or in a marriage relationship. You've also got to position yourself if you want to see God move in your life. Here's the first thing you got to do. You got to accept the mission. Now, the mission was for them to feed the almost 20,000 people. Now, that's a daunting task. Have you ever noticed that God often wants to use us to do far more than we've ever thought that he could use us for? For most of us, when we think about God using us, we think, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not anything special. I may, maybe can't be used that greatly of God, but God disagrees. He wants to do something more with your life and through your life, and until we accept the mission, we'll never position ourselves to be um, receiving a move of God in our life. Here's the thing. You can't pretend that the challenge doesn't exist. You know what the disciples' first reaction was, their first thought was, when Jesus presented them with this mission? By the way, the mission of the church is not just feeding 20,000 people, but it's reaching the multitudes around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot shy away from the mission no more than the disciples were to shy away from the mission that God gave them. What happened? Well, they said that they were going to send everybody away. That was a problem. You know, churches do that as well. Uh, churches will say, well, we don't need to move. We don't need to build. We don't need to change. We don't need to adopt a new strategy. We're comfortable where we are. God says, no, no, you need to accept the mission. The mission is to reach people across this globe with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's our job. It's our job to give to missionaries around the world. It's our job, like we do, to support churches in South Africa and the 40-something churches that we've helped start around the world in, uh, in Holland and in uh, Cuba and throughout Central America and in Haiti and in South Africa and all throughout the United States. And um, we've just seen God do a work because we've accepted the mission in the past. We can never stop accepting the mission. It's our job. You also cannot have a poverty mentality. You know what the disciples not only said, you know, we can just send them away. A lot of churches do that, by the way. They don't do it consciously necessarily, but because they are unwilling to change their program, their music, their style, if you will, they're just telling people, well, as long as you look like us and smell like us and have a haircut like us and dress like us and like 300-year-old music like us, you're welcome to come. Well, who wants to come to that? And the truth of the matter is we need to learn to accept this mission because the challenge is there, but we also cannot pretend that God cannot supply. You know what the poverty mentality is? It says that we will never have enough. We just don't have enough. Well, I've got some bad news. I don't have enough. But I've also got some good news. God has more than enough. And God, when he calls you to a mission, he calls you not only to accept the mission, but to believe that he is going to supply the need. We should never have a poverty mentality. No one ever reaches their full potential with a poverty mentality. This not only applies to the church, it applies to your business. It applies to your health. It applies to your marriage. You cannot live as if there are no answers. You cannot live as if there is not enough because God has more than enough for whatever you're facing. And then the third thing is you simply just can't limit God. Now, I'm not blaming the disciples. They had never seen anybody feed 5,000 men plus 15,000 women and children with five loaves and two fish. 
If I were there, I'd never seen that before. I'd never had heard of that before. I would have been like, yeah, we can't do this. You know why? Because it's never been done. But you know what we never must do is limit God. Because God is unlimited in his resources. He is unlimited in his will to save people. Here's the second thing you got to do. If you want to position yourself for a miracle, you got to accept the mission, but then you got, you got to do your part. You got to be willing to step in the right direction. We talk about taking your next step. It's time for our church to take our next step. You know, you don't run a marathon in one step. And life is a marathon. We often try to treat it like a sprint, but when we try to treat it like a sprint, we end up burning out. Life is a marathon. The Christian life is a marathon. God's not finished with you yet. Somebody got to say amen right there. That's good. God's not finished with you yet. You, You may not be all you ought to be, but thank God you're not what you used to be. God is working in your life. God is not finished. You say, well, you know, I'm not as mature as some people. Well, God's not finished with you yet. You're still alive. He's still working on you. And whenever you get to the point where God says, you know what? She's matured enough. She's enough like Jesus. Then God will be finished with you and he'll take you home. But until then, he's always working on us. He's not finished building us. He's not finished being with us. And we must do our part. Um, if you're going to do your part, you've got to trust God. Jesus ministered even when it was inconvenient. I've got to just say that there is never a convenient time to take a step of faith. Never convenient. Look at all the stories throughout the Bible. Joseph, he took a step of faith by trusting God when he had been uh, Kidnapped by his brothers and sold into Egyptian slavery. Wasn't convenient for him to trust God during those 13 years, but he did, and God used him. He became the prime minister of Egypt and literally, and quite literally, saved the world from starvation. Look at Moses. It was not convenient for him when he had led the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and there was a mountain on one side, a mountain on the other side, and Pharaoh's army behind them and the Red Sea in front of them. Wasn't convenient, but there's never really a convenient time to minister or to take a step of faith. But we've got to be willing to do that even when it's inconvenient. And then Jesus tested his disciples. And I'm going to say that during the next Several weeks and during the next several years, uh, God's going to test you. He's going to test your faith. But listen to what Hebrews eleven six 6 says. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. You can't please God without faith. And by the way, if he requires faith of you, he is increasing your ability to please him. It is impossible to please God without faith because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. That's a prerequisite. You can't pray to a God that you don't believe exists. You got to believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him, that he is who he says he is, that he will do what he says he will do. I got to trust God. Then I got to give what he asks. You know, a lot of times we're willing to do little things, kind of what I would call tips. We give God a tip. We give him a tip of our time thinking that just going to church, you know, a couple times a month, that kind of gets our Jesus on for a little bit, and that we're good. We give God a tip of our time. We'll give him a tip of our resources. We'll give him a tip. But God's not looking for people that want to just tip. He's looking for people that will give what he asks of them. Listen to 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Paul, the apostle Paul, is writing this to the church at Corinth. And these people had taken up an offering that was just mind-boggling because they themselves were poor as well. Which, by the way, God never, ever, ever takes the gift and the privilege of giving away from us because of our finances. And you say, well, you're just trying to use reverse psychology. No, I'm not. The truth is, God knows that when we give It'll be a blessing. Look at what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. These are people that had given. He was telling them this. Because of your giving, God's able to make all grace abound toward you that you, 
always having all sufficiency in all things. I'd say that pretty well covers the basis, wouldn't you? All sufficiency in all things. You know what he's talking about here in the context? Money. He's talking about supplying your needs. So if you give, he said, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, having always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. God wants to bless you. He wants to give you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He wants to bless your life. And it's not always just money. God's not like an ATM machine. We stick in a card and we pull out some cash. God's not the proverbial uh, Santa Claus that just exists to give you gifts. God loves to give you gifts. God loves to bless your life. He blesses you more than you think is possible. He blesses you in more ways than we even acknowledge. But, you know, just because you give doesn't mean, I believe God blesses you financially when you do. The Bible teaches us that. But it doesn't mean if you give a tithe that God's going to give you a brand new Mercedes by the time you get home today. That's not what it means. But he will make everything sufficient. And not only that, you'll have an abundance for every good work, he says. I've got to give what he asks. Number three, and this is the last thought, you've got to believe that God will do his part. So I got to accept the mission. I can't stick my head in the sand. I can't pretend that the need doesn't exist. I can't act as if God has not called me to make an impact in the world. But I've also got to do my part. I got to do what God asks. But then when I do that, thank God it doesn't depend on me. It's on him. God will do his part when we obey. Um, He blesses what I give. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 6. He said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And somebody asked me about that word mammon uh, just this past week. Well, the word mammon, um, more of your modern translations will put the word money or wealth, because that's really what it represents. But the word mammon um, was a, a Greek word or an Aramaic word that represented wealth, but it represented the Babylonian god of wealth. I'll explain that to you in just a second. But the truth of the matter is, money is neither good or evil. When God says uh, in James that, you know, a lot of people say, well, the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. No, it doesn't say that at all. It says the love of money. And that word means the illicit love, the illicit trust. The, I put my trust in that rather than God. And that's the, uh, the contrast that Jesus was showing us between trusting in our own wealth, our own ability, and God. Um, so you cannot serve God and mammon. And what he was referring to is the spirit that was on money. Now, you need to understand this. Um, that mammon was the uh, Babylonian god of wealth, and um, they depended on this. It was a type of the world's provision, and they depended on this, uh, and it was founded on pride and arrogance. Here's what mammon says. I do not need God. I am self-sufficient. I trust in riches or money. Now, let me just ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand because I know everybody's done this. And I don't want to give you a chance to lie in church. All right, so uh, you, ever, you ever thought, boy, if I win the lottery, whoo, boy, I tell you what, I wouldn't have any more worries. Well, would it surprise you to know that the majority of people that do win the lottery have much more to worry about than they ever had before, and they end up going broke? You'd say, well, man, if I won $20 million, I guarantee I would You can't guarantee that at all. You see, what happens is, It is arrogant for mammon or to think that mammon is the one that gives us what only God can give. I I know a a man that has a billionaire that goes to his church. I'm very envious of him. But uh, nevertheless, uh, this guy, his family, interesting, they gave a testimony. And they were talking about how much is enough. Like, and, and they asked them this question, how much money would be enough where you would never worry again? You'd never have to worry again. And you know what the wife said? I don't know because we worry all the time. 
Now, you and I, you know what we do? We see people that are rich or famous, and we're like, oh, man, it must be tough. And we look at their life, and they talk about the struggles they have, and we're like, oh, yeah, I'm sure you got a lot of struggles with all that money. Well, that is a, that is a wrong way to look at things. That is looking at money as if it had the ability to do what only God can do in our lives. You see, that's what the spirit of mammon is. It produces fear and stress and worry and, yes, selfishness. However, when you worship God, mammon promises only what God can give. But when you worship God, God will give security God will give significance. He's the only one that is able to give. Just because you have money doesn't make you significant. It just makes you rich. It doesn't make you uh, any more powerful. It doesn't make you any more blessed. It doesn't make you any more loved. In fact, it gives you a lot of problems a lot of times. And I know, you're, like I am, I would like to try some of those problems, right? You know? And, you know, you hear people say, well, money can't make you happy. Well, I don't know. I've never seen anybody uh, frown when they got a brand new boat, all right? So they're smiling all the time. Maybe it can make you happy. I'm just teasing about that. But nevertheless, the point is this, that when we trust in money rather than God, we always, always fail. Money that is not blessed has the spirit of mammon on it. Now, by the way, we talk about, well, when I don't tithe... My money's cursed. Well, did you know this, that the Bible teaches this, that your money is already cursed? It's not the, saying, well, I'm not going to tithe that curses your money. Your money's already cursed. Uh, money is neither good or bad. We've said that. It's neither good or evil. But money, however, represents something that we will trust in. And when I'm trusting in the spirit of mammon rather than the spirit of God, my money's already cursed. You know what lifts the curse off of it? There's only one thing that lifts the curse off your money. It's the tithe. And the Bible is clear about that. By tithing and by our faith, we are able to say that God has given us blessings. That God has blessed, has blessed that which was cursed, which, by the way, is the story of the gospel. Your life was cursed before you knew Jesus, and when you put your faith in him and in the finished work of Jesus Christ, God blesses you, and he takes the curse of sin off of your life, and he puts his blessing and his grace on your life. You see, mammon says buy and sell. God says sow and reap. Mammon says cheat and steal. God says give and receive. Beautiful, the difference. So when I tithe, my money is blessed because the spirit of God is on my money rather than the spirit of mammon. Well, Jesus multiplies what is blessed. He blessed the fish and the loaves. And when he blessed it, he multiplied it. When God blesses my money, he will multiply its power and my ability to see all sufficiency in all things like what it says in the Word of God. He takes what is blessed and produces true riches. You know what the true riches were in that? It wasn't the 12 baskets left over. That's significant because of what it represented in that culture. But do you know what was truly significant and what the true riches were? It was the 20,000 people that got fed. That's the true riches. You know what God is going to do in our church and I believe continue to do? It's not about buildings. It's not about what we own or don't own because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to let you in on a secret. We won't own it forever. You say, well, why not? Because you ain't going to live in this body forever uh, until Jesus resurrects the body. And during the resurrection, we're gonna, not going to need a church building. We're going to have heaven. And streets of gold are a whole lot better than whatever we're going to get, okay? And so my point is this. You and I need to understand that God will bless what is given to him and produce true riches. During this campaign, every time you get the opportunity to, to give by faith, guess what happens? God rewards you with true riches. When you stand before God, you're gonna know that your giving, your participation, your time made more of a difference than you ever thought possible. You're gonna meet people in eternity that were saved 
because of the giving and the efforts of the people in this church. And they've gone on to minister in other places. And you're going to meet people that you never even knew existed that are in heaven because you obeyed God. And you said by faith, God, I am going to trust in you. Well, I have a whole lot more sermon left, but I don't have enough time left. I got to do this presentation at the end. But let me just say this. God will add prosperity to true riches. The 12 baskets full that were left over um, were significant because of what it represented in that day. When there were leftovers, it represented God's provision and blessing and the opportunity to minister to other people. And it was huge. And God, at the very end of their obedience, just kind of let them know, guess what? I'm going to multiply the blessings in your life as well. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us today as we trust in you. God, I pray that you'd help us today as we begin to make an exciting new move in our church history, an exciting new era of what you're doing in our church. And God, I pray that you'd help us to grow our faith. And Lord, we know that you're going to do what is best for us. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad that you kind of stuck through the end of this with me because we're not quite at the end yet. I want to show you some things as to why we're going to do. This is a six-week series, and we're talking about doing our part. It is a campaign that we are using to help raise money, okay, to help raise commitment over a three-year period, plus we're raising a down payment for Uh, what we're going to be doing. So I want you to understand that. I want to be very clear about this. We are going to give you over the next several weeks, we're going to give you daily devotions that I hope every person in the room and every person online will participate in because it's going to help grow you spiritually. We're not just doing this to raise money. We're doing this for the kingdom of God, but we're also doing it for your sake. We believe that when you grow in your faith, God blesses you. When you give and obey God, he is going to pour out blessings on you that you don't even know where they're coming from. And we believe that with all of our heart. So this campaign is called Doing Our Part. And we're talking about doing our part with all of our heart. And so we want everybody to be involved. It is about equal sacrifice, not equal giving. The fact is there are some of you that are in a great position financially in your life because you're older or you started a business or God has blessed you. And there are others of you that don't make as much money. I want you to understand, we're talking about equal sacrifice, not equal giving. God will bless you in accordance with what you have, not with what you don't have. And so we believe that God will bless you. There are several things I want you to see. Let's go to the next slide there. Um, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I've already talked about that we are by faith taking this step of faith because we believe that God has it for us to fulfill his vision and mission for our church. Let's go to the next slide. There are some reasons that we're doing this. The financial purpose, I've already alluded to it. Um, It'll raise funds for the purchase of property. It will release the finances of the church for increased ministry, and it's gonna help fulfill our mission as a church. And like I told you, it is a much better uh, use of our funds. In fact, um, the, the amount of money that we're looking at for these, uh, these, these purchases of property uh, is going to about cut what we pay in rent in half, in half. We're going to free up more money for ministry, and so it just makes sense. Uh, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus, we've talked about that. Uh, but we want to set a realistic goal and work towards it together. Let me just kind of say this because we're going to talk about some goals, but just so you want to pray about something. For us, what we're looking at doing with what we need as far as purchasing a building and uh, finishing out stuff, having a down payment, etc. The total amount, the total amount, in other words, if we were to say we're going to pay cash for this, it's somewhere around $2 million, all right? Cash for building and any build out that we would do. So, Those of you that have that online, I know you're getting ready to write a check for $2 million. And so I needed to let you know that right off the bat uh, so that you could go ahead and just help us get a head start on this campaign. Uh, But the fact is, we'll need somewhere around $400,000 for down payment and doing stuff around 
uh, to get the things ready, okay? So, just so you'll know, we are going to do this campaign for six weeks. On May the 23rd, we're going to have that night a victory banquet, and we're going to make commitments to God. We're going to pray about it all during the next six weeks. We're going to make our commitment to God and uh, bring our offering, and we're going to see you know, I believe we're going to be able to raise that down payment, no problem, if we all will o- obey God. I believe that we could even see uh, God do a great work and uh, have someone really help us and pay off the whole thing. But nevertheless, whether we get just the down payment or whether we get the entire thing, then uh, we're going to see a great move of God, saving a lot of money, allowing us to minister and to expand as we grow. So that's very important to know. Um, we're, uh, we're going to pay off the loan strategically and systematically through faith, through this campaign. We want to implement a tested and proven capital fundraising campaign with a structured approach. And so, like I said, what we're doing over the next six weeks is praying about this. We're going to help you with devotions. We're going to help you in small groups with uh, small group lessons and so forth. And uh, so, over the next six weeks, we're going to teach you how to be a better steward of your money how to promote spiritual strength through daily family devotions. We're going to inspire a spirit of revival in our church and home because of our faith. We're going to teach everyone how to be blessed financially. We're going to position the church for spiritual and numerical growth. We're going to position our small groups for immediate growth. And then we're going to increase giving and offerings through faith. Because like I've always said, how much ministry can you do for for $100? about $100 worth, all right? And so the more money we raise, the more ministry we're able to do. Once again, equal sacrifice, not equal giving. Let's go on to the next slide there. So this is actually going to be a three-year commitment campaign, okay? Uh, there are gonna be some of you that are gonna pay it all off up front. Others, you say, well, I don't have a lot of cash to give, but I would like to give. And there are breakdowns. Did you realize if you give, I think it's only like $6.50 a week, that in, during this campaign, you will have given over $1,000. So everybody can do something. Everybody can be a part. Um, we're launching it uh, today, and of course, on May 23rd will be our uh, banquet. So uh, next six weeks, we're going to train you on these principles Um, We're going to ask you to engage in family devotions and in the small groups as well. Let's go to the next slide. And um, we're going to be talking about this during the next six weeks. We're going to talk about communion. We're going to talk about redemption. We're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to talk about cleansing. And we're going to talk about loving and giving over the next uh, six weeks in our small group campaign or next five weeks as well. So this is where we're headed. We want to show you some pictures of the facility that we've made an offer on. Now, I want you to understand something. When we say we've made an offer on and we show you these pictures, it's not a done deal. It's never a done deal until you raise money, okay? You know that, right? We're making an offer, but unless we have money to put down on it, you know, it's, you know, good luck with that, right? So, um, so we believe that God is leading us and he's given us just some wonderful, wonderful opportunities uh, that we want to pursue. But we're going to be... Um, This is a picture of uh, auditorium. Uh, One of the shots you can put uh, probably about as many as what we have in here right now uh, in that auditorium. And these are pictures of some of the children's areas, some of the uh, areas in the lobby, and uh, and so forth. So there's there's some great potential here. In fact, this building is pretty much move-in ready, and we can move it. In fact, if we said we're having church there next Sunday, we could do it with no problem. All right, so it's got literally everything that we need. But once again, and I want to reiterate this, we are pursuing God's will. We have made an offer on this. We also have backup plans that we are very, very confident in. If this one doesn't go through, we've got step two that uh, by the end of the summer, we believe we'll be able to make uh, incredible movement toward and be able to be a part of that. So uh, we don't want you to miss that. Do we have any more slides on there? Um, May 23rd, tickets are a dollar. You said, why are you charging a dollar? Because if we give them out for free, people don't feel committed to come. But if you charge a dollar, I know how greedy I am and how selfish I am. If I give you a dollar, well, by God, I'm going to come get what I paid a dollar for, all right? So and you say, well, is it going to be worth more than a dollar? Much more than a dollar. And so we're going to have 
a banquet. Child care will be in, involved um, that you can be a part of. And once again, that's child care. Different than our Sunday morning. Different than our Sunday morning, which is ministry, which is the children and the youth are not the young church. They are, are, are not you know, the church of tomorrow. They are the young church of today. And we believe that making disciples out of them is what we do. We don't do child care on Sunday morning. Uh, we do ministry. And we develop young disciples for Jesus Christ. Help them to know about loving Jesus. So uh, anyway, uh, you can purchase these at any time. We'll make those available in the coming weeks. And uh, you can be a part of that as well. Today, we're going to ask you to pick up your devotional guide. We want everybody to get one. Some of you have already got it. Do we have any more slides uh, that I need to go on here because I don't have? All right, so commitments for the campaign will be made at the banquet after seeking God by faith and prayer, and you'll be able to give your gift in honor of someone. And I will say this, uh, we will take um, more than the forms of giving that we normally take. Normally, we take money. And, uh, but this will we'll take uh, stocks and bonds or lands or real property, uh, what, however you want to give in that. So um, let's go to the next slide. All right. We don't want to just see, we don't want to just move. We want to see a move of God. So today, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to go ahead and ask all of those that are going to be uh, working the tables and giving out devotions, go ahead and get in place. We're going to give them about 60 to 90 seconds to get in place before anybody else leaves. And by the way, let me just say thank you for staying. Man, that's impressive. Normally, as I get down toward the end of the message and start doing next steps, people are starting to head out of here. They're like, I'm gone. I'm going to beat somebody out of the parking lot, right? Uh, but you have been uh, very impressive today. And so if you would, even if you're a guest, because you don't have to be a member to do these devotions, um, we want you to pick up a devotional guide and it will be a real blessing to you, all right? So uh, if you've already picked yours up, just kind of wave at them, show them your book or whatever, and then on the way out, you can just bypass the tables. We've got several areas that you can pick these up. There are four tables in the lobby here. There are two tables here in the back, so it shouldn't cause a log jam. So stop by and pick it up. Let them mark your name off the sheet, and we're excited about what God is doing. And so let's pray together. And ask God to give us favor and blessing. Let's do that together. Heavenly Father, I pray for our church. Help us to fulfill your mission, reaching people wherever they are into a growing, bringing them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you just bless our people. Help us to follow you in the word of God. Help us to do our devotions. Help us to do our small groups. Help us to pray about what you want us to do. Help us to be excited about inviting people to come hear the good news of Jesus. And God, I pray that you just bless us as we look forward in faith to taking this next step uh, in our church's history. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I love you. God bless you. And we will see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.